fantastic. Share something. Ooh. Okay. I am so sorry. So I asked Connor if I could share something before this. This is when we were practicing this morning, and this morning when I was practicing on my own, God kept impressing on me an image. I shared it with Chris, but um, I was fortunate enough to get to go to Israel once. And when I was there, they took us to the place where Jesus was tempted by the devil on the mountain, you know? Um, if you look down from there, you see Jericho. And I mean, they're like right next to each other. What impressed me about this is that Jericho is not a pile of rubble. Jericho is a hole in the ground. When God took down Jericho, he took it down completely. It's like the earth opened up and swallowed the city. And so I started thinking about that. When the people were marching around Jericho, that had to seem kind of silly. Um, but they were obedient and they were praiseful. And those are the two things that the devil can't fight, is when we turn our hearts in unity um, to God, and then we use praise as a weapon. So this morning while we're singing, I want you to weaponize your praise because it is gonna bring down strongholds. It's going to bring peace. It's going to change things in your life if you let it. Amen. Well, we'll ask you guys to stand with us as we praise this morning. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the one.
the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching it.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
Let's just stay in this minute. Let's just stay in this posture for a second. So as we end this this worship, um, Father, we thank you. We thank you that we're able to host your presence, that we're able to steward your presence. We thank you that we're here gathered this morning just to honor and glorify your name, Father. We honor you, Lord. We glorify you. Everything be done in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You guys may be seated. All right. So, um, Pastor Michael is not here uh, today. He is currently, uh, right now, in Lubbock, Texas, doing a men's retreat revival. So, you guys have the honor and privilege of hearing my mom speak this morning. Um, She's kind of awesome. Um, But before that, let's do tithes and offering. So, uh, we have, I believe, three ways um, text to give. You can drop it in the offering box. Oh, we, we have four ways now. Um, you can do it online or you can mail it to us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's pray. Let's pray for the offering. So, Father, we thank you. We honor you. And, Father, I just ask that anything given be given to further your kingdom, to progress your kingdom, to honor your name, and, and everything that we give be blessed unto you. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen. All right. Good morning, Oakland. Remember our prayer room tonight at 6? Our final softball game is tomorrow at 6 against New Covenant at Tate Cummins Sports Complex. So come and cheer us on. Uh, Day at the Lake is this Saturday coming up at Lake McBride from 11 to 6. We're going to meet at the lodge. You need to bring a picnic lunch for your family. Um, Email address. I will be the first to confess. I filled out one of these last week, and I took it home. (laughs) So please, look in your bulletin today, and you will find circled name and email. We need your name and email to update everything. And I didn't tell you where to put it last week. So you put it in that clear box right back there. So I am actually going to go do that right now. Good morning. Um, I get the chance to talk to you today about a new project that we are starting, and it was mentioned a few months ago by Jackie when she was talking about uh, various mission projects that we have and ways you can get involved. The um, project is a compassionate ministry room. It's sort of like a food pantry, and we're also going to be helping Safe Families Organization, and it's going to be back there in that room on on the end, that small classroom. Um, We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and this is a way that we can do that. Um, We will have non-perishable food items as well as household and hygiene kind of things. And we also, our goal is to help save families. Now, I know Wayne and Sherry have talked about save families. And if you have any questions about save families, I feel sure they could um, help you with those questions. If you are someone who would consider hosting with safe families, but maybe not have the resources to do so, we want to help you with that. We can have diapers and baby and kid things, as well as some things to check out, like pack and play and stroller and high chairs, things like that. Um, I also have a baby scale in there if you're someone who's a new parent who would like to just keep track at home of how your baby is doing. Um, that can be checked out as well. Um, On the back of the um, bulletin, there is a list of suggested items, and there is also a sheet of paper in front of the bulletin board that has the same um, kinds of 
same list on it. And if you would rather not buy things to donate, we would also take donations. Just mark it, missions, compassionate ministry room, and it'll get to me. Um, if you have any questions or if there's something you feel like maybe would be good to have in the compassionate ministry room, um, please see me. I'd be happy to talk to anybody with any questions that they have. And you can put items um, in the bin in front of the board out there, and I'll be taking stuff out so there'll be room. Thank you. Good morning. Pastor Michael comes up with an iPad and I come up with my books. <laughs> and this, the headset, by the way, is a big stretch for me. I've got both hands free, crazy hands here. How are y'all doing? Good, good. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We love your holy presence. Would you teach us this morning? Would you direct my words? Help me to articulate what you've weighed heavy on my heart. Give us wisdom and revelation this morning, Lord. And I pray this over this beautiful group of priests. And over your church. Move in the midst of us. You are welcome in this space. You are welcome in this place. This is your house, Lord. Whatever you want to do. I thank you. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. My heart is so heavy and burdened this morning. Um, it is an honor to come up here and share. I do not take it lightly. I feel the weightiness of what the Lord has. And what I want to share this morning has a lot to do with our heart posture. about having the heart of worship. How I love to worship King Jesus. And one of the greatest gifts of revelation that the Lord has given me in my personal walk is how I'm beginning, and I say beginning, to step into the reality of being a worshiper. A worshiper. I feel like I'm in infancy at it. Now, I'm not talking about when my hands are all over the place, and, and I know I'm a bit extra for some of you. I know that. But what might seem extra to you feels so natural to me, my expression. I was not always like that. To be quite honest, for a long time, I was the person that was the last in the door 
and the first one to bolt the minute that the pastor said, dismissed. And when worship was going on, I didn't understand. I didn't have a mindset for it for a long time. Just how special it is to be in a place where you can come together unified as one body to worship the Lord. I used to think, let's just sing a song. That's what worship is. Well, I'll just sing a song. No, 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 no. How many of us know that it's not so much what we say, but it's what's in here. That's why when I don't see people with their hands raised, I don't think, oh, well, they're not worshiping because I don't know what the Lord's doing in in there. The center of being a worshiper is your heart posture. Psalm 84 says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. Think about it a thousand days, slightly more than three years. So, better is one day. One day. In his courts, than a thousand days, than three years anywhere else. I want to talk about the power of a day. The power of one day, one day in his courts, one day in his presence. The power of what one day with Yeshua, with Jesus, what he can do for your life. One day can mark the rest of your days. Think about that for a minute. Better is one day in your courts. Than a thousand anywhere else. There is power in this day. There is power in the here and now. You are not here by accident. And teenagers, if you think that you are here because your parents made you, no. You're here because the Lord impressed upon your parents to draw you near to him because he has something for you. So don't check out today. Please don't check out. I wish somebody had told me that when I was 15 and when I was 16. I wished I had heard that. I'm sure it was said, but I don't think I heard it. I don't think I had ears to hear. The Bible talks about the day of salvation and Hebrews 3.15 says that today, if you hear his voice, do what? Don't harden your hearts. What does God have in store for us this day? What does God have in store for you this day? Or is this day just like any other day? I feel an anticipation in my heart that the Lord has marked 
this day. For many of you in this room. Better is one day in his courts. What are his courts? His courts are where his throne is. And his throne is where his presence is. And his throne is where he dwells. So better is one day near you than a thousand days elsewhere. And the thing that I love about environments where the Holy Spirit is welcomed, where he is pursued, It fosters an environment. It cultivates. An environment where we can step into something that's more than just a song. Yes? I mean, if we were in the courts of heaven, they've been worshiping for eternity. And it's the only right response when you get near him. And beloved, if we could just have the lens that we are we have the opportunity to be in his courts right now because the presence of Jesus is here. Do we get the weightiness of that? It may not look like what some other churches are doing. Don't let those preconceived notions build a nest. Let the Lord do what he wants to do in your heart. And it might be in your workplace. It might be in your car. In your home. On your walk. On your hike. But it definitely, most certainly, has to be here. Has to be. But the thing about the presence is the great revealer of where your heart is. I always say before revival comes revealful. Because when you're in the fire hose of the Holy Spirit's presence, he starts stirring. He starts bringing things to the surface if you let him. You can definitely walk into a service, walk into a worship set, and not feel a thing. You can be numbed out. Or... Beloved, we can open our hearts. Say, what do you have for me this day? What do you want to show me? What do you want to unlock in me today? I have good news. <laughs> our heart was created for the presence of Jesus. It was created for that.
And I have to think, when I was, you know, when I was five years old, I had emergency open heart surgery. Emergency open heart surgery at five years old. I was the first child in the state of Kansas to have the surgery that I had. I have a scar that's pretty big. In today's day, that scar would maybe be about that big. But I thought about it. If we have the healing mechanism for the physical, let it soak in of what the Lord can do with the emotional state of your heart. There is so much ability for the Lord to heal. Come on. His healing mechanism is incredible. Your heart was made for an environment where hosting and welcoming the presence of God is supremely important. You don't need a lot of sermons. What we need are encounters with the presence of God. Yes, we need teaching. We need discipleship. I am not saying we don't because we certainly do. I certainly do. But that's not all there is. It's not. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. But beloved, how many of us know that what has happened in previous days can affect your heart today? And there's this theme in Psalm 50, 15 and Psalm 72, 2, referencing the day of trouble. In the day of trouble, your heart is affected in those moments. And oftentimes, a day in the presence of trouble can affect the rest of your day. Like how you process that one day. And then you come into the presence of the Lord today. And oftentimes, what happened yesterday or in that day of trouble, whether it have been a year ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago, If you didn't deal with it and process it rightly, it closes your heart off to today. Trust me, I wrestled with this this morning. I wrestled with this message last night. I wanted to share something just different. But the Lord really weighed this on my heart. According to John chapter 4, it says that he is seeking worshipers. What kind of worshipers is he seeking? He's looking for worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth. So if the Father is seeking worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth, what does that exactly mean? What does it mean to be a worshiper that worships in spirit and in truth? You see, I've been asking the Lord, what does that mean? Because I want to be a worshiper. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be nonchalant 
and the presence of the Lord. I want to be intentional. I don't want to miss out on what he has for me. Because I've let something block me up, harden me. So the Father is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Lord got me thinking about freedom. How many of us want to be free? Come on. Do you want to be free? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How many of us want to get undignified before the Lord? I do. Come on. I want to dance like David. I want that posture of the heart, y'all. Life is too short not to. And again, I'm not talking about the expression. I'm talking about the heart posture. And if you're feeling condemnation, it's not. Maybe it's conviction. The heart posture. Where I want to be first. I want to be in the front row. The front row of what the Lord's doing. I don't want to be hiding. And trust me, I've wanted to hide my whole life. And you can ask pastor. I am very comfortable in the back row. I am very comfortable just sneaking in. Unseen. You may not think that, but. How many of you know the Lord doesn't care? about what the person to the right or to the left is thinking about you if your heart posture is not gazed upward at him. not interested in counterfeit. He's he's interested in the real thing. And again, it does not have to look like this. He sees your heart. I think this just naturally happens because your heart so open. So the two prescriptive measures for freedom for your heart are those two things. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes. In John 8, 32, it says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Meaning, he is looking for those that have been liberated by the Spirit of God and by the truth of God. You see, I think true worship is returning a heart that has been freed by his spirit, by his truth, and we are presenting his work before him, and it delights him. But here's what happened, happens. When you get into an environment where the presence of God is and the Holy Spirit is moving, oftentimes what hinders our worship are those things that we have 
not been set free from. What is hindering? Is there anything hindering you? That's what I've been asking myself. Lord, if there's anything that's hindering me, bring it to the surface. But the good news is that when the Spirit of God comes into a room like this at Oakland, and when he comes into the prayer room, he comes in to liberate. He comes in to create worship in you. Some of my favorite times in worship is just when the, when the music when the musicians, when it's faded back, and it's just the strumming. Or it's just the keys. Or it's the padding. And you have, you sailor, you wait. starts to minister to your heart as you're ministering to his. And he starts to write words on your heart, songs on your heart, prayers on your heart. That stuff used to drive me crazy. It used to annoy me. Now I long for it. I'm like, ooh, let us hit that. Let us hit that swirl, Lord. I want to hit that today. I want to get in the midst of that. You see, in environments like this, And there's a lot of places where the Lord is moving. A lot. You know what the Lord is moving in addiction centers? The Lord is moving in workplaces. All it takes is one. Just one. And it can catch like wildfire. The posture. Environments like this that we get free. And you know what happens when we get free? There is so much hope for the person next to you to get free. There's a frequency of freedom that radiates You see, I remember when we had Ethan. And I remember. I remember the person I was. I remember how angry I was because of things that had happened to me in my past. The choices I had made. And the consequences. I remember when I had Ethan and thinking, oh, Lord, how am I going to take care of this human life? But I'm a mess. I didn't realize it at the time what the Lord was doing, but, you know, the Lord works all things all things together. And even when we don't see it and even when we don't feel it, he is moving. You see, I prayed for Ethan. 
I prayed for Michael, that the Lord would send me a husband that would love me, that would cherish me. And I was praying those things even when I didn't think I was worthy. And how many of us know that the Lord's timing is perfection? It may not seem like it, But it is. He comes to liberate our hearts. You see, I think we all need encounters with the Spirit of God and the encounter with truth. And some of us are already coming in this room with that posture. Some of us just may need refreshed in it. And some of us may be thinking, what on earth are you talking about? And some are just spectators with no interest yet. But where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. available to each and every one of us. None of us have arrived. We're all on a journey. We're going from glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith, and hope to hope. So no matter where you are today in this room, you're in this room, which means you are in the good fight of faith and truth, Faith in the Spirit and faith in keeping your heart open before the Lord and before others. Don't get blocked up. Allow the Lord to tenderize those hardened places. Because what happens is when the Lord starts speaking to you about those places that he wants to touch. I know this firsthand. I've experienced it. That when the Lord starts bringing things to the surface, or the Lord starts bringing thoughts that aren't your thoughts, the Lord starts stirring in you what he wants to deal with, what he wants to heal what he wants to reveal and you don't allow him to do it, your heart can get hardened that much more. It's a real thing. I could have been free a long time ago. But instead, my day of trouble led me into anorexia My day of trouble led me into self-loathing. My day of trouble led me into bitterness, being cynical, critical. I was living so far beneath what the Lord had for me. How you posture your heart before the Lord is critically important. The beauty of the Christian walk is that the work has already been completed. And it's just posturing our hearts in such a way that we can actually see what has already been provided for us. So this morning, if I may... I want to talk to you a little bit about some things that might hinder us from seeing him rightly and preventing us from being true worshipers at heart. A 
we understand that the scripture tells us that every issue of your life flows from your heart. Proverbs 4, 20, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that everything was made beautiful and everything was appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let brilliant light shine out of darkness, is the one who has cascaded his light into us, the brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of of Jesus Christ or face-to-face -face presence of Christ. So it's important that we know the state and condition of our hearts. Our lives are dependent upon the state of our heart. Our relationships are dependent upon the state of our heart. We live from our heart. We might think we live up here, but a lot of times what's hardened in here migrates up here, and then there's a blockage up there. And so it's hard to have a kingdom lens God's perspective. We've learned to armor up by shutting off our heart, closing down our heart, and we've learned to do a lot with our heart as a means of protection. But in the presence of God, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in his presence. I'll be really honest with you. Sometimes when the condition of my heart is revealed when the Lord reveals it. I don't like it. And sometimes I'm like, oh, yay. As a worship leader, I led worship for a few churches and um, I do not have any instrumental ability at all. Don't. Wish I did. Ethan's teaching me how to play a little. Um, but one of the things that I would notice as a worship leader is that, you know, I had the songs on deck, my set list. And I think I want it to be just perfect. I want it to, I want every minute of that worship set to be timed out. I want it perfect. And then I would even have songs in my back pocket that were kind of my, if the pastor is going to say something and he wants something else played or um, if there's a lull or something. <clears throat> And a lot of times I'd look out, and you can tell when people are like, are we doing this again? Can we please move on? I'm done. I'm tired. <laughs> and then you look over, and there's somebody that's just warming up, just coming alive. It's like, Oh, I want that. And I feel like that's where I'm at right now. Is that there's days 
I could listen to our worship team just lead us in worship all day long. I love getting in my car and I love turning on worship music. And the beautiful thing about worship music is that depending on what kind of atmosphere you're in, worship can change that atmosphere. But let me say something on the other side of that. If you listen to heavy metal or music that is raging and not edifying, It can get toxic in your heart and your environment can even get toxic. Because of what's being played out, what's being put out in the atmosphere. When Michael and I are are walking with people through freedom or we're counseling, one of the biggest things... We don't say it all the time, but one of the things that that we do share is what is playing in your house? What is playing in your car when you get in it? What are you saturating the environment in, the atmosphere in? When I drove home to Kansas a few months ago, um, that was a long nine hour drive with Wonder by myself. Woo, Uh, 45 minutes outside of Cedar Rapids, I called Michael and said, what have I gotten myself into? Um, And when Wonder would start to stir and get really cranky, first thought that came to mind was what am I playing? Am I listening to a message? Am I listening to a podcast? Or what's going on here? What am I listening to? And so I changed the worship, you know, the the worship music. And I'm nice and slow. And it would calm her. It would soothe her. I've seen it done with even animals at home when they're barking and they're going crazy. Sounds silly, I know. But it helps move you in that posture. There's something about praising him, worshiping, and just speaking it out. There's something about not focusing on the inward and focusing on him. Yeah. What I've wanted to move on in those moments in worship, what I realized is that that the Holy Spirit is giving an indicator of where my heart is. Where's your heart? Are you hoping? that the service is going to get over quickly so you can go to the next thing? Or are you locked into a heart of worship where you just want to worship the Lord? You want to pursue Him. You want to woo Him. When we draw near to Him, He draws near. To us. Yeah. I love this picture of David in Psalms 27, 3 through 5. If an army encamps against me, my heart will not fear. If war arises against me, in spite of this, I am confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. 
For on that day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. He will hide me in the secret place of his heart, of his tent. He will lift me up on a rock. He's setting this before him for his heart's sake. That's what David's doing here. Though externally I am surrounded and opposed and the odds are against me, internally I have positioned myself before the presence and the tabernacle and I know that he will conceal me in the day of trouble. He is your defender. He is worthy, worthy to be praised whether we feel like it or not. Paul talks about about the hard lot. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer person is decaying, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is produced for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The heart is threaded throughout the Bible. And do not fear, when I think about how Paul would put it, I think he might actually phrase it as giving into fear is, do not lose heart. Do not shut down your heart. Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Hallelujah! Yes! Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We are regularly to renew our hearts and our minds in the presence of the Spirit and in truth. It's the Spirit and truth that liberates our hearts no matter what we are facing. We must continue to worship him in freedom and continually posture our heart in such a way that he moves and we can receive and do what only he can do in his home, which is our heart. Galatians 6 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. Let's not become discouraged in doing good. For in due time we will reap. If we do not become weary, weary. I think fear, discouragement, weariness, and even waiting can cause us to lose heart. So, to make it personal, Michael and I pastored, we were at a small church in Illinois several years ago, and 
Ethan was in elementary school then. And you see, I have a career, 14 plus years in human resources management. And when Michael and I first accepted the call into ministry, I had the dream job of my life. But I knew, I knew the Lord was calling us. And I had faith to believe that even though I was going to give up this dream job, he would provide another job. And so we left and we went to Louisiana. And the Lord blessed me with an amazing job an hour and a half away. We moved to Corpus Christi to pastor. And he blessed me with an amazing job. We moved to Illinois. 37 interviews. 37 interviews for 37 different jobs in one year. I am not exaggerating. 37 rejections. And we were poor, counting pennies, knowing exactly the fuel that we needed to get from place to place to place. You see, when I was 15, that's when I got my first job. I have parents that have such a strong work ethic. It was, it was imprinted upon me at a young age. You work, if you're able, you work, you get a job. And I love to work. We're in this tiny town, and I was even willing to drive like three hours. <laughs> Didn't know how it was going to work out, but I was willing. And I remember being in this season of waiting. And there's this saint in the church. She's in her 70s, Sarah. And I've never to this day heard anybody that can play the guitar like she can. And she and I led worship together. And we would come at the church and we would do all night prayer rooms in the, in the room or in the church. Just praying, praying, praying and worshiping. I remember the first time I heard her lead worship. And it was like, whoa, that's what that looks like. Sarah's heart was bare, bare before the Lord, bare before everybody when she led worship. And she was gifted and anointed. She was relentless in her pursuit to get at the feet of Jesus. And she didn't care how ridiculous she looked. She didn't care if she sang off key. And Sarah's life was She's transitioned into glory, but I think of Sarah often. Because I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that exposure. Because in that season of waiting, the Lord showed me how important it is to have a posture, a heart posture of worship before the Lord when you are getting rejected. 
when you are not getting the promotion you want. People are hard and mean. And things are not going the way that you want them to. That heart posture. You see, I couldn't even get a job as a janitor. I was willing to scrub toilets at that point. I had been so humbled and kicked off my high horse. And I'm thankful for that. That was one of the hardest seasons. But weariness, I had to fight that off. I had to worship and pray that away in that year. I, I knew that if I allowed the enemy to get a foothold, then depression would sink in, and anxiety and fear. And my day of trouble would become a life of trouble. And I did not want that. And we moved to Louisville, and we planted a church, and the Lord started opening up doors right and left with jobs. And right before we moved, I, after seven interviews, I did finally get a job offer. But the Lord was calling us to plant a church. And you know, we move here, and the Lord is so good. He is so good. He allowed me to consult for an amazing company based out of Tennessee for a year. Look at the timing of how the Lord moves, how the Lord works in your life. The day that I signed my contract was a day that I knew that we were going to be moving here. And what was supposed to be one month turned out to be one full year, and it got us through when Ethan was done in California. Praise the Lord. And another awesome job opened up here. But I didn't feel like it was right for me that I could be there long term. And I prayed about it. And so, in obedience, I did not stay. But I had an opportunity to interview with another company, another organization. Three interviews. One of the two top candidates. And I felt in my heart this job was mine. And I got the call Friday that I was not selected. Now here, I, I don't tell you this to feel sorry for me, don't. Because what I want to share with you is that in that moment, I'm in Walmart, and I'm thinking, Lord, just let me hold back these tears. Do not let me have this moment of ugly crying, because that's what I wanted to do. So the Lord, in his goodness, allowed me to keep my composure until I got through that checkout line. I get in my car, and I just lose it, guys. I mean, ugly cry, snot. I mean, wailing. And I know some of you are thinking, it's just a job. No big deal. I wanted that job. I felt like that job was mine. But in that moment, there was a split moment where the Lord reminded me Where's your heart, April Perkins? Where's your faith? And 
so I just start praising. Like, Lord, you are good. And while I don't understand this, I don't get it. I do not question your timing. I do not question your will. I want your will for my life in this situation. And I know you're going to open up the right job and your timing. It doesn't mean that I wasn't embarrassed or it didn't sting, because it did. Rejection hurts. And the Lord reminded me, April, I do not find your worth or your value in the job that you hold. So I, dust, I dusted myself off, wiped my tears away, changed the position of my heart, and then the Lord started reminding me at that time in Illinois, that year of waiting, and how he provided and how he came through. It's the beauty of testimony, y'all. If you're going through a hard time, ask the Lord to show you a time that he got you through. Because it will strengthen your inner man. God is so good. I'm going to say this. If you need to go, that's okay. I'm not done. If you need to go, it's not going to offend me. I just ask that you go quietly. I'm not going to interrupt what the Lord is doing right now. John 14, Jesus' final words to his, to his disciples. It's the most read letters in the Bible. And it starts from John 14 through John 17. And you see, John 14 reflects the process of losing heart. It's Jesus' final words. Do not let your heart be troubled. This word troubled means to be agitated, for there is to be inward commotion for the external and to affect the internal in such a way that you lose peace, you lose confidence, and you give way to fear. Trouble comes in a day. How many of you have had a day of trouble? You've lost a job, death of a loved one, financial problems, marriage problems, trauma. It can come in many forms. Your heart cannot handle a day of trouble. It's not meant to. No one is strong enough to deal with the blows of life, and if we're not equipped from a heart standpoint to put our hearts in the right place with the right people, we can get taken out really easily. How do we get taken out? Addiction. Pornography. Being cynical. Rebellion. When you don't deal with your day of trouble, whatever that might be, a day of trouble can turn into a week of trouble, turns into a month of trouble, turns into a season of trouble, turns into seasons of trouble, and can turn into a life of trouble. Where you are shut down, your heart becomes locked down. You just white knuckle it, grit your teeth, gut it down, and before you know it, the day of trouble can become a cycle of dysfunction. And it bleeds into your worldview, your perspective. You become hardened, cynical, blind to what the Lord is doing and speaking. And instead of living, it becomes just about survival. But inwardly, it can cause you to be locked. But the Father seeks worshipers that worship in spirit and truth. He is looking for worshipers to be liberated no matter what they're facing. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the good news of the gospel, of what Jesus has done for you and me, 
We can live from a different perspective because of what he has purchased. I love Revelation chapter 5 because I believe it's, it's heaven's leadership. It's a great example of that. Revelation 5.5 5 is where John shows up in the glorious setting of singing around the throne. And John begins to weep because he sees a problem. The problem is that no one can open a seal. But this elder, this leader in heaven comes up to John while he's weeping. And he grabs him and he says, stop weeping. Behold. The lion that is from the the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome. Hallelujah. It says, and one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has has overcome. So as to be able to open the scroll and its seven seals. It's a picture of biblical leadership. Biblical leadership. Whatever that might look like. Should constantly help posture you. So that you can see the one seated at the center of the throne. To see what he has already accomplished in light of what you're going through and in light of what you see. Biblical leadership says you've got to stop doing that so you can see him. Stop being offended. Stop criticizing. Stop living in a way, whatever it may be, that impairs your view of the Lord and hinders your worship and adoration. Behold. Behold. I know some of you, I don't know what you're going through. I don't. I don't know where your heart posture is. But I know some have been through excruciating pain, unimaginable loss, gut-wrenching disappointment and suffering. And I am not making light of that. I'm not. But beloved, you cannot allow that to outweigh what he has done for you. You can be honest and authentic with him. He can work with that. He can work with questions. And you can bring it before others that will genuinely help walk you through it and pray for you. But again, The spirit of the truth, the spirit of truth, if you'll let him, will liberate your heart so that you can be a worshiper in spite of what you've been through. Real quick, and Jesus was positioning his disciples for that in John 14, 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Don't let this outward reality of what you are about to experience, because they're about to go through the ringer. A lot of trouble. And he's telling them, don't let your hearts be troubled. He starts talking to them. Letting them know that he's going. Jesus' disciples ask two questions. Two questions in John 14, based on what he's saying. And I believe that these questions are important for us to see and understand. Because when we start asking these questions, it's where trouble can set a root in your heart. 
John 14, 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? This is the first question I often see that trouble brings to our hearts. Where is God? Where are you? If you, if you are who you said you are, and you are where you say you are, then why am I going through this? Where are you? That's a question asked a lot. And once we get past that day, that question that creeps in, God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you... Why have you left? Have you forsaken me? And the further from that day that you get, a chasm starts forming. And a false narrative forms about God based on that question of where was he when I, threw, when I went through what I went through. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you? For so long a time, and yet you have not come to know me. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me, show us the Father? I think what Philip is asking in this question surrounds the nature of God. know how loved you are? Do you know how much he loves you? And there is nothing you can do about it. His grace is sufficient. And his love, if you'll let him, can melt all kinds of sorrow Therapy can be a wonderful tool. Wonderful tool. But the thing about therapy is that if it is not foundational and based on biblical truths, it's just a tool. A great tool. But the Lord wants to set people free. And it does not have to be trauma. It can be freedom from a cynical perspective. It can be freedom from grumblings. See, trouble attacks where God's been and what he's like. Be careful not to get stuck in making agreements. That do not point to the real nature of who Jesus is. And a lot of times we see things through our own experiences. 
he is so much more than that. So much greater than that. In John 14, we're introduced to the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. I'm going away, but the Father is going to send a helper. And the helper, the Holy Spirit, answers those two questions. Where is he? And what is he like? That's why we always have to make room for the Holy Spirit to move so that he can purify our hearts and we can see him rightly. And when the presence of God moves, it will not look like what you think it's going to look like. We can't box them in. got a lot more in my notes but I'm going to ask Connor if he'll come up John 16, 20. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one is going to take your joy away from you. You see, what the presence of the Lord does is he gives us a glimpse into the resurrected king and proximity to him can change everything. So I'm going to ask you, where is your heart posture today? Are you a worshiper or are you just a song singer? Are you a worshiper that when the trials and tribulations come against you, you get blocked up, shut down, guarded? this to you. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I'm going to lay down all my preconceived ideas of what I think that should look like. Because it doesn't matter what I think it should look like. I just want to worship you. I want holy hunger for the Lord. I want my mind to be expanded to where I can ask things and I have such a faith to believe that the Lord will bring it into fruition. You don't get that head knowledge. It's a heart knowledge. 
It's not about your intellect. It's about your heart. About your heart. So Connor's gonna, gonna lead us in this amazing worship song, Heart of Worship. I'm gonna ask you all to stand with me, if you will. Hear me. I want Oakland, my heart, and pastor's heart for Oakland Church of the Nazarene is to be a place where the presence of the Lord is so welcome, where he is so pursued that he is attracted like a moth to a flame because there are hearts of worship casting their crowns down at his feet. It's not about programs. It's about the collective priests that are going to priest before the Lord, worshiping day and night and night and day. When the Lord brings revelation to your heart, it is not a punishment. It is not condemnation. It is love. Sometimes there's a sifting that has to take place. Sometimes he has to burn things up. But he doesn't do it without our permission. He doesn't do it without our Yes. I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend the rest of my days not giving the Lord thanks and praise and blessings. Because what happens in your heart grows feet and then action starts happening. Before you know it, you're doing things that you never would have done before because the Lord is changing your heart. Everybody bow their heads, please. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the more, Lord. Take Oakland into the more, Lord, of what you have, Father. Give us eyes to see what you're doing, Lord. Give us ears to hear you, Lord. We enter your courts with thanksgiving and praise. And better is one day in your presence than a thousand days anywhere else, Lord. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Break through, Lord. Break through. We're open. We're open. Thank you for the invitation to the more, Lord. And Father, I just ask for grace, 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 grace. Let us not not be casual, Lord, but let us be We love you, Lord. Bless you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. So I'm not going to belabor this anymore. There's not going to be words on the screen, I don't think. If you don't know the words to this song, close your eyes and let the Lord move your heart. The altars are open. If you need a fresh, a 
fresh outpouring. If you want the more. Maybe you just want to come to him and repent and say, Lord, I've come to you casually and I just want that. I want to be a worshiper. The altars are open. I'm going to ask you to worship along. Just you bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you. search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you yes it's all about you I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, but it's all about you, yes, it's all about you, Jesus. you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my
thank you, Lord, for how you have moved in this room. Thank you that you are moving in the seats, that you are moving in our hearts, Lord. We love to worship you, Lord. You are King of Kings. You are high and exalted and lifted up. And there is nowhere I'd rather be than at your feet. I thank you for Oakland Church. I thank you for this amazing group of people that want to pursue you, Lord, that want to see transformation in hearts and in communities, Lord. So, Father, as we continue about our day, Lord, let us not forget, Lord, that you are on the throne. And in the days of trouble, Lord, let us turn our hearts towards you. Even when it's a sacrifice, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I bless you. I bless each and every person here. sorry I did go way over today I'm sorry not sorry felt like the Lord was moving <laughs> um, I also want to say um, keep your um, if y'all want to just have a seat real quick um, if you're a teacher can you stand up I know I'm putting you on the spot but if you're a teacher whether it's your teaching here or you're teaching at school if you work in the school systems look around like, there is preparation, there is prayer that goes into the work of, of what they're doing. And so I thank you for that. Um, keep them in prayer as the school year's getting ready to, I don't know if it's already started or it's getting ready to. Um, keep teachers in prayer. They've got a hard job. Um, keep students in prayer. We've got some college um, young adults that are getting ready to go off to college and so um, keep them in prayer keep their parents in prayer okay we'll work on getting that list together like we did last year so that we can send care packages and letters and cards um, we just want we're a family we're a church family and so um, the beautiful thing about family is fellowship and relationship and so we just want to continue to foster that. And um, yeah, prayer room tonight, six o'clock. Don't miss out. All right. And I will seek you 